Welcome everyone to today's Edison Electric Institute webinar about the 2020 Edison Award winner at Coase Alberta Power Line. My name is Vanessa Ferrero and I'm a manager for international programs at EEI. Today's discussion features speakers from ATCO who will discuss their innovation during the construction of the Alberta Power Line, as well as the importance of engaging with Indigenous communities. Before we get started, I want to go over some housekeeping items and remind everyone of EEI's compliance with antitrust laws. As you all know, EEI and its members are committed to full compliance with all laws and regulations and to maintaining the highest ethical standards in the way we do business. This commitment includes strict compliance with federal and state antitrust laws. Throughout this session, we encourage you to join in the conversation by submitting questions using the chat feature. The webinar presentation and recording will be made available to all attendees after today's session. Now I will turn this over to Lawrence Jones, Vice President for International Programs at Edison Electric Institute, who will moderate today's session. Thank you, Vanessa, and good afternoon, but I should also say good evening or even good morning given the fact that we have a very diverse audience on this uh, webinar today, people dialing in from Australia, New Zealand, and I believe also from Asia to participate, and in fact, also from Europe to, to learn about this. As we all know, uh, transmission is a very important aspect of what we do in this industry. As we look at the move to a cleaner energy uh, system around the world, infrastructure is extremely important. And we know for a fact that getting large amounts of renewable energy onto the power grids around the world will definitely require infrastructure, especially transmission infrastructure. We also know the challenges you face in terms of building transmission is one that cuts across nations. We understand issues from permitting, siting, making sure the financial models work, uh, making sure you have proper engagement of your stakeholders. And so we're delighted today to have a conversation uh, with our friends from ATCO uh, they won the Edison Award for the Alberta Power Line and will be joined today by Andrew Pope and Craig Shutt. They will both initially give us a quick overview of the project and then from there we'll get into the conversation about this very fascinating project. So Craig and Andrew, over to you. Thanks, Lawrence. Good afternoon to everyone and welcome. We want to thank the Edison Electric Institute for this opportunity today to present the Fort McMurray West 500 kV transmission project. I'm Craig Shutt and I was involved with the project from the RFQ through to operations as the project manager. And with me today is Andrew Pope, who is the commercial manager involved with the financing and sale of the project ownership. To start off today, we have a short video to share with you. As I reflect on the challenges Canada is facing today with large linear infrastructure, I think the Fort McMurray West 500 kV project stands out as, as a significant project in Canada that was really occurring with very little fanfare as we quietly went about our business. A lot of people uh, they maybe wouldn't recognize the challenges with building across the northern Alberta landscape but incredible logistics challenges, large, large tracts of muskeg, and so construction periods are broadly limited to winter. You have construction teams working in um, very cold climate conditions. There are really important wildlife species in the terrain. We did some very innovative construction techniques in order to to ensure we didn't have a negative impact on these caribou herds. We engaged with 21 Indigenous communities. That engagement 
led to meaningful work opportunities. These are Indigenous communities that we here at ATCO have had a long-standing relationship with. For me, it really was the relationships and the partnership, and we really solidified the relationship with Quanta through this project. And back to our community roots, we had a significant role in working with local communities, Indigenous communities, landowners, landowner groups. What's special about the project is all the aspects that we're involved in. The relationship between Quanta and ACO, the success of the team has really been inspiring to watch. When I watched the teams at work, they were all working for Alberta Powerline. They were all dedicated to the West Fort McMurray project. I think collectively we came together and delivered something that is very unique in the world. So sometimes uh, video doesn't always come through well through our Wi-Fi and such. So if you're looking for the video in the uh, slide notes, there'll be a little note of where you can find them on YouTube. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Pope, and I'm excited to be here today presenting to you about the APL project. Both Craig and myself will be going over key aspects of the APL project in detail today. What we really wanted to do is provide you with a you know, first preview of the key learnings of the project. First and foremost, starting with the most important one is engagement. Throughout the project, meaningful engagement with all of our stakeholders in an open, transparent way was critical in ensuring alignment of overall goals across the key stakeholders. This included not only engaging with our key project teams, but also with our communities, landowners, government agencies and Indigenous partnerships. Finding innovative solutions and not only how we built the line, but also how we built the innovative commercial structure was essential in delivering the project on time, on budget, and at competitive rates for our customers. Last but not least, uh, challenging the status quo. Providing an opportunity for equity ownership to Indigenous communities was not something that we had to do. This was something that we wanted to do. Working with our Indigenous partners is an important aspect of building critical infrastructure such as the APL project. Hi, it's Craig again. At ACO, we always put safety first, so we'll do a quick little tailboard for our presentation today. Now that we've seen an overview of the project, we'll get into the details. Andrew will first review the commercial structure that we needed to be successful for this competitively bid project. I'll then take us through the project scope, including the technical challenges we faced and how we met them and how this enabled us to energize three months early. Andrew will then show us the commercial strategies that enabled the project to have the lowest net present value, which was substantially less than initial forecasts. I'll then discuss how we managed engagement and environmental concerns. And Andrew will then conclude with the sale of the project ownership which included a 40% stake for Indigenous communities. In the second half of our time, as Lawrence mentioned together, today we'll have some time to answer your questions. Let's take a look at the project timeline. The origin of this project can be traced back to 2008, when the Alberta government introduced a new energy strategy. This strategy highlighted the important role of electricity for the province's economic development and had several goals, which included minimizing costs as well as maximizing innovation, the desire to create opportunity for new market entry and to mitigate project risk. In 2009, legislation was passed that deemed the Fort McMurray West transmission project to be critical transmission infrastructure and the need for the project was thereby created. Between 2010 and 2013, the competitive process was developed 
And in 2014, Alberta Powerline submitted a bid to develop, design, build, finance, and own and operate the project. And after initially competing against 30 companies from around the world, APL was awarded the bid. This started the project development period, which completed in 2017 when the Alberta Utilities Commission approved our plans for facilities and routing. And in September of that year, we obtained the project financing and began construction. In March of 2019, the line was energized, three months ahead of its target date. The project itself is situated in the northeast portion of the province of Alberta and stretches for 508 kilometers from the Thickwood Hills substation near Fort McMurray in the north to the Sunnybrook substation west of Edmonton. The length of this line also required three fiber optic repeater sites and the Livix substation. When developing the project, the ISO estimated the price for construction at $1.8 billion Canadian. The APL bid, including construction as well as operation for 35 years, was $1.6 billion. This was a significant reduction to the project tariff. The project also included a number of firsts for Canada. It was the largest P3 bond issue and the longest 500 kV AC line in Canada. And as we've mentioned, the project energized three months early. And one of our proudest accomplishments was that we completed more than 3 million person hours of work with zero lost time incidents. In 2014, when we secured the project with Canadian Utilities and Quanta, we entered into two overarching agreements with the ASO. This included a two and a half year agreement that covered the development period of the project called the Project Development Agreement, as well as a longer contract that was a 35 year agreement called the Project Agreement that covered the construction and operating periods of the project. Both of these overarching agreements outlined the obligations of both parties and how the ASO would pay APL over the 35 year operating term. It's worth noting that outside of a few adjustments to the payment that are outlined within these agreements, these are effectively fixed price contracts. One unique aspect about this project when you compare it to other P3 type of projects is that the ASO defined the endpoints for the route, but it was APL's responsibility to select the best route and then go out and secure all the permits, land rights, regulatory approvals, and to build the final route. This resulted in a fixed price contract without exactly a fixed scope of work. In a typical P3 project, the authority would normally secure this route as well as this land before a proponent would come in and, and start working on the project. This risk was however identified within the agreements with the ASO and there was allowance for some adjustments to the payment based off of key changes to the route. When bidding the project, a team created a structure where all the risks inherent in these contracts that sat with APL were pushed down to the subcontractors via drop down back to back contracts. That allowed us to mitigate the overall risk at APL and be able to raise a significant amount of debt at competitive rates. This structure allowed APL to be as competitive as possible in its 2014 bid and ultimately secured the project with this structure. Thanks, Andrew. Let's look at the project scope in some more detail. As I mentioned, the project included the two substations, three repeater sites, and 508 kilometers of line. It also had over 1,300 towers, of which close to 1,200 were the guide V structures as shown on the right uh, picture in the slide. We had more than 6,000 kilometers of conductor, which was more than enough to cover the distance across Canada. There is 508 kilometers of overhead shield wire and 508 kilometers of fiber optic cable. In addition, we had 47 million pounds of tower steel. And with all this material, APL introduced a strong supplier integration program that included traceability and scheduling from manufacturer to each structure location. This directly improved the overall quality management of the project. It reduced material distribution errors and it helped accelerate the construction schedule, which was so important to the project's success. Let's take a look now at some of the challenges. Probably the toughest challenge of working in Northern Alberta include the terrain and the geotechnical conditions. The majority of the route terrain is covered in muskeg, 
which is a peat bog that can only support construction when frozen during the winter. As a result, the construction schedule is highly compressed, which required extensive construction planning with well-managed access and solid contingency plans for those times when conditions and weather would change. Because of this short construction window, our workforce peak was nearly a thousand people working in conditions that could drop to minus 40 degrees Celsius. The second major challenge dealt with the geotechnical conditions. As the line access is opened up, that is the first opportunity to take borehole samples, which then in turn determine the foundations. To manage this, studies were completed to create a set of 17 soil profiles with foundation options developed for each structure type. The geotechnical borehole program went in right after access was created and while the ground was still freezing to accommodate heavier equipment. Material was then selected and dispatched from local depots for just-in-time start of foundations. We've talked about access and its critical role for line construction. During the project development period, the entire route plus all of the construction access and workspace was mapped out. The access was planned to enable safe and efficient linear construction. It also had to meet regulatory requirements and constraints. We wanted to minimize the duration spent on the right of way and the overall impact on wildlife. And we wanted to ensure that indigenous and landowner concerns were addressed. The southern third of the route was mostly in private lands and the road network there met most of our requirements. Whereas in the northern two thirds of the line, access was limited to some oil field and forestry roads and more extensive work was required. For example, the right of way between the Thickwood substation at the far north and the Livick substation shown by the star on the map, it was the right of way itself that proved to be the best access between the two sites. During the first winter construction season, we focused on completing as much work as we could in the northern work fronts as possible. And after that first winter, construction was ahead of schedule and the geotechnical boreholes were keeping ahead of foundation installation. This positioned the second winter season to complete early. The single largest effort on the project is the construction of the line itself and this is also where significant challenges had to be met. In particular, as I've mentioned, we wanted to safely accelerate construction and reduce overall time on the right of way. The major contributor to success in our line construction was the Guide V Tower. It was designed specifically to meet the project requirements, both for construction and for maintenance and reliability. For example, the structure is designed to support maintenance using live line techniques to avoid outages. These towers also simplified foundation requirements and made use of prefabricated guy wires. The towers used less material, and most importantly, they could be assembled as a complete structure on the ground and then could be erected with a single lift. For comparison, more than 10 guide V towers could be erected in a typical day versus one self-support lattice tower, which would typically take about two days to erect. As a result, the construction of the line was completed early and this facilitated the early energization at the end of March in 2019. It wasn't just technical innovation that was a key part of the success for the APL project. Commercial innovation was also applied throughout the project and significantly contributed to the overall success. This initially started with our overall commercial structure. We're partnering with Quanta and Ballard and the use of drop-down contracts to help mitigate the overall risk to APL in turn allowed for a unique one-of-a-kind financing structure for the project. Our Indigenous equity ownership model created an opportunity for Indigenous ownership and critical infrastructure with shared economic benefits. Expanding on the partnership model, but we really believe that the partnership with Quanta and Valor was a key aspect to the success of our project. Both companies had multi-decade years of experience in designing, building, and operating transmission lines. There was also a long history of working with Quanta and Valor, as Valor has acted as a key construction par partner on a number of Canadian utilities and Aqualetrics transmission lines. 
This history of working together and the shared learnings from recent large projects was incorporated into the APL project from day one, with Ballard acting as the constructor, and Atco Electric providing route planning, operations, and management services. Both companies were able to apply and bring their depth of experience into each area for the benefit of the project. The use of the drop-down contracts ensured accountability for each subcontractor and ensured the project was delivered on time and on budget with each party understanding their responsibilities and their requirements. Beyond this experience and history of working together, having both parent companies of Atco Electric and Valor through Canadian Utilities and Quanta ensured that through their equity ownership, an overall alignment of goals and objectives on the project so that the full project could be delivered on time and on budget. Moving on to the debt funding and the, and the financing, but the, as Craig mentioned, the funding that we raised was the largest in Canadian P3 bond history. These funds were raised through an innovative debt funding competition that happened in 2017, where banks were invited to competitively bid on the optimal structure of the debt for the project. With the goal of securing the lowest interest rate possible and an overall smooth fixed payment profile for the 35 year operating period of the project. The competition also allowed for innovative solutions where banks could propose different structures to meet these objectives. This resulted in APL raising 1.4 billion in funds via four fixed interest rate bonds with very maturing dates. The underlying assets, strong partnership and experience of the team created a well sought after bond offering. Thanks, Andrew. The 508 kilometer route is roughly 380 kilometers on public land and 130 kilometers on private land. And it traverses across the territories of 21 Indigenous communities. As we mentioned earlier, meaningful engagement with all of our stakeholders ensured alignment throughout the project. This included not only engaging with our project teams, but with our communities, landowners, government agencies, and Indigenous partners in an open and transparent way. We engaged extensively with landowners and communities as we rooted, designed, and constructed the project. We held more than 3,000 in-person meetings to ensure that we understood the concerns and viewpoints of all groups, and we worked to integrate that feedback into our plans. As a result, APL obtained its permanent license from the Alberta Utilities Commission with minimal intervention by third parties and with no Indigenous or NGO objections. This is uncommon in today's world and can be attributed to our comprehensive strategy. We also implemented an Indigenous contracting strategy to engage the communities as active participants on the project. This led to meaningful work opportunities, as well as skills training and local economic development. We incorporated Indigenous people's interests in our approach to environmental protection. For example, our comprehensive caribou protection program is now setting a new standard for construction in Alberta. Let's look at the program in a little bit more detail. The woodland caribou is not only a threatened species, but it's important to the biodiversity of Alberta. It also plays a central role in the culture of the Indigenous communities close to this project. Potential impact on the caribou was identified early in the project planning as the line passes through roughly 160 kilometers of caribou range. We worked together with the government and Indigenous groups to develop the caribou protection program as part of our larger environmental protection plan. The caribou program included efforts to avoid interaction where possible, as well as efforts to minimize the disturbance of their habitat. Examples of this mitigation included mitigation by design principles, which were implemented during routing and access planning. We also had the development and review of various mitigation options, including a specific caribou workshop in 2015. There were a number of construction strategies that were implemented, including maintaining minimum distance between construction and caribou, crew training, and the reporting of sightings. And there were opportunities such as selective vegetation retention and planting along the right of way, which were implemented to reduce line of sight for predators of the caribou. This plan is still in use throughout the operating period for the line. 
Moving on to the sale process, the overall sale process took us approximately 12 months from the official launch to closing of the transaction. Um, but that 12 months doesn't account for the many months of planning that went into the project um, in the year follow, uh, in the year leading up to the launch of the process. But from the very beginning, meaningful Indigenous equity ownership in the project was an important goal from ACO. And in order to achieve this, we structured the sale process the sale process into two phases. The first phase was a broad sale process where potential purchasers were invited to bid on a 60 to 100% ownership in APL. After entering to definitive agreements with the successful bidders, a second phase was then launched. This was a 60 day option period. During this option period, there was a option to purchase a minimum equity ownership stake provided to the indigenous communities that were along the route of the line with the opportunity to purchase up to a 40% ownership stake in the project. This two phase sale process and the 40% ownership option that was on reserve for the communities was contemplated from the very beginning and was communicated with all bidders, you know, including the phase one bidders, as well as the communities, so that all parties understood the process uh, and what was being put on offer. Once we sold the project, it's, it's worth knowing that even though 100% of the project was sold, ACO still remains as the operator of the line via a drop down contract with APL. Expanding on the Indigenous equity ownership model, ACO was always looking for an opportunity to provide Indigenous communities a way to become owners and share in the economic benefits of infrastructure projects such as APL. The APL project presented a unique opportunity to do this, given its non regulated nature and standalone contracts with the ASO. With that in mind, we structured a sale process that would allow for this ownership. 40% was reserved for communities along the line with established government rights within APL based on the ownership level of the communities. Each community decided to not, if a community decided not to purchase their minimum equity ownership stake, other communities would be able to purchase their minimum stake. This was structured in a commercially reasonable way and clearly communicated throughout the process, which we believe resulted in a financeable and bankable project. This resulted in seven Indigenous communities purchasing the full 40% ownership, providing a stable source of income for years to come. Finally, here's a look at our digital trophy case. APL's achievements have been recognized by a number of awards across multiple disciplines, from construction to financing to innovation. The Edison Award itself is a prestigious award and something we're very proud to have received. This grouping of awards demonstrates the planning and effort that went into the APL project. But the team didn't focus on just one aspect of project delivery, but giving the attention needed to each aspect and discipline in order to deliver this world-class project. And with this, this concludes the formal part of the presentation. I'll hand it back over to Lawrence for, for Q&A now. Thank you so much. Uh, this clearly demonstrates, uh, Andrew and Craig, why this project was selected by the jury of independent judges to, to become the, the award winning. Lots of interesting questions. I think I want to start off with the issue of engagement, stakeholder engagement. Um, how critical was that in the success of the project? Because you said I believe, Craig, that uh, there was little environmental intervention, more or less. Uh, and we know that's one of the big things facing infrastructure projects across the world, that their concerns, rightly so, about the environmental impacts of these studies. So how essential was uh, the issue of stakeholder engagement in terms of uh, getting this project off the ground? Well, um, like you say, it was uh, the critical cornerstone for the project. When we started in the initial planning stages, that was the opportunity for us to first get out and talk to the various groups involved. And that helped set the stage for all of our planning efforts. When it came to things like rooting by engaging Indigenous communities, we would understand their use of the land and could make rooting choices uh, to work around that. Or we could work to do uh, accommodations. And in several cases throughout the construction period in our ongoing engagement, they would come out and observe construction, especially at key areas like river crossings. Um, I think when we talk about engagement, it, it, 
it provides the basis for all of our work. It allowed us to build a project, like you said, that had minimal uh, issues. And that allowed us to go into a regulatory process um, with basically a group of folks that were more like our uh, colleagues as opposed to somebody that might be opposing uh, an aspect of the project. And that was very important to us. And with the project kind of being in our backyard, as it were, um, ACO is very focused on maintaining strong relationships with the communities and the Indigenous communities we serve. So um, this is our ongoing model of the way we would like to do things with them. Not so much just consultation, but actual engagement. So and I think to, I was just going to add, add to that um, in terms of the engagement as well. Um, you know, with our communities and, and offering the, the equity ownership, I think, you know, that was a continuation of the engagement, not just the engagement up front to get the project built, um, but also, you know, continuing that engagement, continuing the dialogue, um, coming forward with an opportunity for them to have an equity ownership stake in the project. I think that's part of that fulsome engagement package that, uh, you know, ACO did on the project from, from beginning to end. So I want to talk about a couple of topics around the theme of innovation. And, and maybe we'll start first with you, Craig, since you had the slide of a technical innovation. We'll come back to the commercial piece with Andrew. So from the technical innovation, can you talk about some of the challenges of the design? Because you know, one of the things when you're designing new towers, you, you have to battle between what has already been done, which can sometimes be the easiest route to go. And then when you talk about coming up with a whole new design, you, you face internal resistance to want to come up with a whole new design because the engineering codes have to change. There are a whole lot of things that have to go into building a new a new tower. So talk about how you manage the internal struggles of innovating around a new tower design. Absolutely. Um, and that was quite an exciting part of the project. When we talk about the Guide V Tower, that was something that came out in the very early steps of our development of our bid. We were looking for ways to innovate and set ourselves apart from the other proponents. And the Guide V Tower was one of the uh, key ideas that was developed. And in order to get the tower uh, suited not only for construction, but also for that operations uh, period, so that it would maintain the reliability that the operating uh, groups would require of it, we had the operating groups integrated into the project from the very beginning. They participated in the bid development itself and in the initial engineering design of the towers right through to its testing and then its implementation. So by having them integrated and, and a larger integrated team as a whole throughout the course of the project, um, like you said, that buy-in was something that we worked on a common front that everybody was working on it together. Um, and the Guide V Tower has proven to be very successful for us. We have done some maintenance using live line techniques already for it. So uh, we expect it to do well for the project. So one of the things I find fascinating is people always say that the power industry is not innovative. Hmm. And oftentimes we don't, as an industry, do a good job in talking about what I call heavy, in, heavy innovation. You know, infrastructure innovation is oftentimes not considered. What has ATCO done to, to tell the story around the technological innovation for, say, the average Albertan citizen who doesn't understand that that tower looks beautiful today, but there was a lot of brain power that went into it. How have you, what have you done to kind of uh, tell the innovation story from a technology standpoint around this project? That's, that's a good question. I think it goes back to a lot of the time that we spent ensuring that um, all of the groups involved, uh, including landowners, various communities, indigenous communities, the government, um, through our process of engagement, not just in the initial planning stages where we we're presenting stuff for approvals, but through the stages of construction, um, you know, we, we brought forward all of the things that we were doing in order to try to make uh, this transmission line uh, fit for purpose, specifically for the purpose it was needed for, and at the same time to do it in a lowest cost method. Um, so there's been that ongoing effort to bring awareness to the Guide V Tower. I recall even during the initial stages of planning, we developed things like visual mock-ups so that somebody looking at a horizon line would get a feel for what that Guide V Tower would look like. Mm -hmm. So these were some of the tools that our 
folks that were engaged with the various communities would use to help them understand what the tower was. One last question. Oh, sorry. I should also say we, we've done a number of press releases. And of course, uh, we very much enjoy the opportunities like this Edison webinar, webinar to uh, talk about it. Well, let me just ask one other question and come back. I promise Andrew will come to you. But one more question, being, being a, tech, a tech nerd myself here. Um, <laughs> regarding the, the avian event, right, the avian issue, a lot of people talk about how transmission towers and others distract birds when they're flying, right? And, and even the ones when you come further down to the ground, you have, you know, wildlife that might run into the towers. What are some of the concerns you have from the environmental perspective as it relates to the actual design of the tower and how it would interact with, uh, with wildlife and, and even the, uh, the avian uh, wildlife? Right. So the towers themselves have a relatively small physical footprint, but it is a center point plus four uh, guy wires. And in order to you know, increase visibility, there is a number of things we did. Um, the guy wires themselves would have uh, high visibility uh, guards on them. And in sections where there was avian concerns, and of course, you know, this is part of that rooting exercise where we look at all of the concerns as you go by or near water bodies, marsh areas and such. Um, and you look at what type of species of birds are in the area. Mm -hmm. Mitigation would then come from reviewing what the requirements were and we would put on various things like bird flappers and uh, other kinds of things that would help increase the visibility of the line. And again, I think it's kind of like the caribou exercise. You start from an exercise of mitigation design and principles in your rooting. Then as needed, you mitigate um, with the tools that you have. And in particular with our guide V tower, uh, we look to adapt those tools to be applied for that tower. Good, we'll come back to innovation. Uh, I, don't, I wanna talk a little bit, I mean, to technological innovation, let's get to the commercial aspect. We said the other, reason that made this project so fantastic uh, and, and so well received by the jury within the uh, the Edison Award uh, 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 selection process. Uh, so Craig, talk about the, I mean, sorry, Andrew, talk about the this whole P3 structure. What made this different from other funding projects, projects you funded in the, in the, in the province? Why P3 as, as, as an approach? And then the other question is, um, do you think going forward, this will be the model for other kinds of projects uh, within Alberta or even outside? I know you guys are also active in, uh, in, uh, in um, uh, Puerto Rico, right? So do you see this model extending beyond Alberta to other parts of the country or the world? I think from a, from a P3 perspective, it, it's a pretty established model in a number of jurisdictions for the governments to find a way to um, you know, partner with you know, private companies to you know, build critical infrastructure um, that they want and to you know, structure in a way contractually to ensure that they get what they want at the end of the day. And, you know, the private company who's, who's building it is, is delivering on that kind of on budget and on time. So it's a very, it's a, you know, a very structured type of type of agreement, but really, you know, gets the, the outcome that you're, that you're looking for. Um, in terms of the APL project, um, it was quite different than other P3s. Um, from the two contract nature of it. There was a development phase as well as a construction and operations phase. Um, and that really hasn't been done before. So a typical P3 would have, um, would have a, you'd be in the construction phase and you'd have financial close. You wouldn't have this design and development phase. So that was a really like, unique aspect, but you know, for this project, it, it, it really did work. Um, and, and we were able to you know, deliver it on time and on budget. So you know, the ASO itself created this very, you know, innovative, you know, P3 structure. And then within that, you know, we work within that structure to um, develop our commercial, you know, structure through our partnerships, um, through our drop-down contracts to, um, to mitigate the risk to, to APL. And then you'll be very successful on the, the funding competition, uh, which in, in, you know, from what we know is that that funding competition hasn't really been done before. It was kind of a first for, for a project. And that really ties back to the whole, you know, development period and, and project agreements. So, you know, we had to innovate through through that whole, through the structure, um, through how we did the debt funding competition to, to deliver on the project. And, and actually I find some applicability for this approach, even in the emerging markets, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in, in Latin America and elsewhere, where there's a huge demand for transmission to be built, but there's not enough 
funding to do it. So this could be something that certainly can have a, an appeal there. Let's let's talk about the the portion that has to do with the with the 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 the, the, the different groups that were involved, the indigenous groups you've talked about that uh, that were involved in. Um, you know, sort of a buying part of the equity uh, further down the project. Um, what were some of the challenges you had? For example, did you did you have to build within the project model itself from a commercial standpoint, certain um, community build, com community development work? So give you an example. In some projects, uh, P3 projects, uh, you know, you asked to sort of uh, invest in schools, you invest in, you know, community building. Did you have to do some of those kinds of things as part of this, uh, this structure? Um, Craig, you correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I don't believe within the exact agreements there was a requirement for a certain amount of, you know, you know, community spend. But I would say, you know, from an ACO perspective, you know, as we're engaging and consulting with the communities, we're always looking for opportunities um, to, you know, employ Indigenous communities and, and find, find, you know, work. So even though there was not a specific requirement, you know, we, we look for that through, through our engagement and through the construction side of the project. Yeah, yeah. One other question on innovation, and this is a tricky one. So both you, you and uh, Craig can take it one or the other. So, so timeline, right? We know that transmission projects normally take a long time. So I was just doing a quick math here. So you started in 2009, by 2019 it was done. So it's 10 years, right? So bravo, that's a huge success for a transmission line in North America. So if you take the three issues that make transmission lines difficult to get built on time and budget, one, permitting, uh, siting, and, and then also just the whole uh, development aspect of it. For those three areas, which one of them created most delay or caused some delays uh, that you would have probably been done even sooner? Was it the permitting side that was difficult? Was it the siting or was it the actual build out? Which of those three areas created more problems for you in this project? That's an interesting question. Um, this project, like we mentioned, used a different business model. It was a competitively bid process compared to a direct assignment where the traditional utility of an area would be assigned to build that portion of the project. Mm -hmm. And there are benefits to both models. Um, in a direct assigned process, you don't have to go through the length and time of a bid process uh, because you would proceed straight into the development of the route. Um, but the nature of the competitive project, I think, allowed as a very solid planning upfront window. Mm -hmm. And that also, um, you know, went into the permitting stage. So I, I think the permitting stage um, was kind of a typical project. The construction phase itself, um, we did a lot of effort to ensure that we could complete it within two winter seasons. Um, ATCO, uh, Electric, and Ballard, the constructor, have done other projects over the past several years. And I think what really helped this project was the experience and the lessons learned over the past, you know, five to 10 years before this project that then could be applied directly into our project. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those things that would typically be a little bit longer for permitting or a little bit longer for construction, um, we saw a lot of benefit from those previous projects that way. And, and Craig, and, I'd also probably add from a, yeah, you know, from a commercial perspective, you know, the agreements themselves um, also incentivized um, hitting the timelines. You know, in a typical P3 project, if you, if you don't hit your timelines, there, there's penalties. So you have not only you're wanting to build and wanting to you know, deliver on your contract, you also have, you know, the, the mechanisms within the contract and also allowed for through early energization, the ability for, you know, additional months of of payment, so you're, you're incentivized not to go over, but also incentivized to to come in early, um, which you know drives your overall teams as well to kind of meet those deadlines and meet those timelines. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, one of the other things you mentioned, I think, uh, Craig, you did in terms of uh, at least in the agenda, you had ESG on the agenda, and I want to mm -hmm. talk a little bit about just some of the lessons learned in terms of making a project sort of uh, environmental friendly, right? Mm -hmm environmentally sustainable. Can you talk a little bit about some of the things you learn from a environmental standpoint in this project? Uh, for example, in the area of, um, of uh, material, right? Waste of material, you know, you use a certain amount of copper or steel or whatever, right? How are you able to optimize the resource use to make this project? So you said you had X amount of resources, 
but you were able to reduce it towards the end to demonstrate that the environmental footprint was actually less than you had anticipated. Talk right. about that whole process. Mm -hmm. Boy, there's a, there's a lot of stuff to talk about. <laughs> um, first of all, let's, let's start with the overall time on the right of way. Yeah. So we had a very well thought out construction plan. And like I said, we had staged equipment going in at different times, coming out, uh, moving linearly without interruption. And all of that serves to be on the right of way for a smaller period of time, less impact to the general environment. And then in addition, there was a number of things we did on construction. So for instance, like when you talk about material, the, the overall structure mass was less, so we saved material there. And there were things like the pre-made guy uh, wires. These were fabricated at the depots where the material was. And by using the survey data of the foundations, and exact measurements, they would create the exact guy wire they required, and it would go out and be delivered to site for the erection. So a lot of the material that you would normally kind of expect to, um, you know, kind of extra cuttings or whatever, that kind of stuff, a number of things were done along that way to ensure that uh, there was minimal wastage. Um, and they, the, the whole material management program, we've got to give them a lot of kudos because they, they manage things really to a T. And another uh, key environmental lesson, I think, um, you know, the guys spent, uh, the team spent so much time on the caribou uh, protection plan um, that it became interesting to watch as, like you said in some of your other questions, utilities sometimes have a predisposed mindset. And so we actually looked at planting vegetation under the line mm -hmm. after we finished building it which um, we had to have a number of conversations with our operating group to kind of say, we're, we're picking vegetation that won't grow into the line, but will provide cover for, for caribou. Yeah. So um, I always like the way Andrew put it, that we're challenging the status quo. So there was a number of areas where we challenged the status quo and um, you know, the environment was able to benefit. So Andrew, on the on the commercial side, the commercial innovation piece. So so Craig just Craig just talked about the you know savings on the equipment and what have you, uh, materials. From a commercial side, um, what has been the response from the the different groups who have equity in the project today? Uh, have you gone back to them and and, and gotten their you know their, their their reaction now that the project is there? How are they responding to it? So it's not like you've done well, the project, you walked away. Have you gone yeah. back? And, and, and actually, we, we haven't fully walked away um, from it. So through our 35-year operating agreement, as well as we provide management services for, you know, for the project, we have regular interactions with the team during, you know, we help organize the quarterly board meetings. Um, we work with the teams, you know, quite regularly. Um, and, you know, from what I hear from them, they're, they're very happy with the investment. They're very happy with how it's performing, um, the, the quality of the of the project um, and the kind of the certainty and the low risk aspect of it, and, and you know, you continue to this day, uh, you know, very complimentary of you know the Aqua team in terms of how we're supporting them, you know, over the 35 years. So we didn't just sell and walked away from the project. You know, we're still partners with them through an operating phase, um, as well as through um, helping to manage aspects of the line for them. And are the are the communities helping you guys, uh, Craig? And both you and Andrew can respond to this, but. I'm always intrigued when these kinds of structures are done. Um, I get an equity and that's all, I'm, that's all I care about. But in some cases, the equity owners actually do a, a, a very active, play an active role in, in talking about the project, in talking up the project, right? Have you guys gotten the support from your equity shareholders in terms of, uh, I mean, your equity holders in terms of promoting the success of this project? Uh, I can pass on a few uh, notes on that. Uh, the, the new ownership and the board specifically and its management committee are very interested in the concepts of ES and G. And that's something we talk about whenever we get together with them. Um, they were very pleased, I think, with things like the Caribou Plan. And um, we've had a number of requests to provide pictures and information for various circulars and such that they're doing in their various organizations. So it, it's very gratifying to see that um, the results of everybody's effort is, is being uh, recognized. And we hope that what we learned uh, can be applied by others and they can gain a similar benefit. Any thoughts, Andrew? I know I'd, I'd, I'd share uh, Craig's thoughts. It's uh, you know, it's generally positive. 
um, you know, people in groups talk about ACO, kind of how we engage. And, you know, this is an example of a project of, you know, how we went out to the communities, said we would do this and actually went and did this. Um, so you do get that, that word of mouth, you get that type of, um, you know, brand and, and, and credibility behind you. And, you know, we still work with these communities on, on, on numerous other projects. So you know, just having, you know, a project like this um, and how we work with them on it, it's, you know, it's, you know, it sells itself in a sense that you're able to do other things with, with those communities and, um, you know, and for, for everybody's benefit. Yeah, I'm, I'm perhaps biased to this growing up in a, in this, in this industry and having a lot of uh, transmission focus for myself that, that uh, I always believe the transmission lines are among the most beautiful things in the world. Most people disagree with me, um, but, um, but that's just my own view. But we have about five or six more minutes left here. And so I want to maybe try to wrap it up by first having each of you reflect on won an award for this very interesting project. And three questions, very short, but I will just put them to you like this. So what would you do again if you had a new project, uh, similar wherever in the world? And I, and I want you to think beyond because we want more transmissions built, transmissions lines built because we want to have more renewables, we want to have more energy uh, accessibility around the world. So we need transmission, but we have the barriers which we see through this project we can avoid. So we replicate the model, the ideas from this ACCO project around the world, we could see more transmission lines built much faster. So if you could do this again, what would you do again? What would you do differently? And what would you not do? So maybe you go first, whoever wants to go first, what will you do again? What will you do differently? And what would you absolutely not do if you had to do another transmission project in a very hostile terrain as you were in this case? Maybe I'll, I'll start off with what would we do it again, and I think we touched on this you know, a number of times. It's it's the it's the engagement, you know, the engagement with all stakeholders and, and meaningful engagement. You know, we do that in any one of our projects, um, and it's, it's setting up the right team, you know, from the beginning. You know, picking the right partner, um, having expertise and depth of experience, kind of where you're building, is, is always beneficial as well. So, you know, if we were looking at that, you know, we'd look for partners. Um, in those regions that we'd be able to, to partner with um, that have the expertise to be able to deliver on the project. So, you know, I do, you know, those two things, you know, again and again on, on, on any one project. Anything you will not do. <laughs> There's a, honestly, there, there wasn't anything that came to mind. There was a lot of challenges through the project and there was a lot of uncertainty about how the you know the financing competition would play out, how the indigenous ownership would play out, but um, I wouldn't do it differently than how we structured it, um, and how we staged it, and how we worked, and how we engaged. So, I mean, it's a bad thing to say, but there's nothing that came to mind kind of through kind of my seat going through the, the commercial and sale process that I would, you know, that I'd say I, you know I have to change that. Um, it, it did work out um, in, in in the planning that we did. I'm actually very happy to have a commercial guy and a technical guy on this panel, on this uh, dialogue, because I know when I was in, in the business of, of selling technology, we would always run into issues with the commercial guys who would say everything was perfect, nothing to change. So Craig, do you agree with Andrew? Uh, what was different or what would you do differently? What will you do again? And what would you not do? So let me see how my theory of commercial and, and technical yeah. guys always work. Let's see what you're going to say, Craig. I, I've got a few thoughts and I'll, I'll share an anecdote. Um, <laughs> I, you know, it was, it was a very good project and we had a good foundation between partners and we'd worked extensively over the past five, 10 years. And throughout the whole course of the project, we had the same people involved, you know, the same leadership teams, uh, the same key individuals, the, the design. And like I mentioned, we had O&M people involved from beginning to end. So that's one thing I would definitely do again, that concept of continuity and team. The second thing I thought that was so good on this project was the solid planning and the contingencies. Um, we had the opportunity to challenge all of our assumptions. You know, when somebody would say, you know, brushing will work out like this. And, you know, you could ask the question, well, what if it doesn't? What would we do? Um, and so we had the opportunity to work through all that. Another thing I think that was very important with this project, and I think this is part of where the overall competitive process wanted us to go, was that idea of fit for purpose and innovation. 
So the guide V tower, if we were building a standard direct assign project, that might not be on the table for selection per se. It may be prescribed what type of tower type is going to be used. So I think that was really good. Um, so there was a number of things uh, from the execution side. Um, you know, if I had the same team and, um, you know, the same key components, I'd, I'd love to do it again. It was a great experience. And, um, you know, when we talk about, you know, how commercially things are looked at and how technically things are looked at, I remember when we were at the financing discussions with the bond uh, folks and, you know, who would be financing the project. And I remember one of the questions they kept coming back to with the different groups was, well, what happens if winter extends too long? You know, their experience would have been like a hospital, perhaps, as a P3, and extending winter is a bad thing. But for us, we would always just smile and say, no, no, it's good. It's all good. <laughs> We're all good. <laughs> so um, I don't think we had, um, I'm, I'm knocking wood here, uh, we really had the stars aligned and everything came together really well. Um, there's a lot of things, um, you know, that we know from our combined experience and transmission that you try to avoid. Um, and the things that really helped us do that were uh, solid teams, continuity, uh, engagement, planning, and, and thinking outside the box and making it fit for purpose. Well, listen, we've run out of time here. We could spend, uh, I could at least spend the entire day trying to get a very good understanding of this. I must tell you that I have a little pet project that I hope to embark on at some point in my life here, and that is to travel the world and take beautiful pictures of transmission towers. Uh, because I marvel over them. I grew up, my father was a transmission guy. Uh, and so I've always loved transmission lines because I'm, I'm always intrigued by what went into the thinking of these massive structures that are built. And once they're built, they're left there by themselves, right? And they're, they're so important for our lives, important for the world to bring energy to vast billions of people. They won't get it without transmission. Unfortunately, not everyone understands the power and the value of transmission. So Really, thank you so much. Uh, and again, I congratulate you all on, on winning the award. And um, if I, once COVID is over, the next time I'm in Alberta, I would love to go there and, and, and see this award winning uh, tower and, and uh, just see what you've done there. So thank you so much. And uh, I'll turn it over to Vanessa who will tell us more about uh, what's coming up next from the Edison Electric Institute. Vanessa, over to you. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you again, Craig and Andrew, for sharing APL's story and the lessons learned with us. And thank you to everyone for joining today's webinar. We hope you found the discussion valuable and insightful. We will send out the webinar presentation and a recording to all attendees. And we look forward to your attendance at our future webinars and virtual events. To continue engaging with EEI International programs and to learn about other upcoming events, please follow us on Twitter or visit our website. Thank you and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.